Uh, this presentation is really was originally focused on information architecture and the role of information theory there. I think it's equally as applicable to content strategy, and I've added a few slides to address that directly. And we'll see how that all works in just a moment. Uh, let's get subjection there. And I guess the big thing about Factor is really our focus is on large scale enterprises and um, projects that entail um, enterprise scale scenarios, multiple systems, multiple stakeholders, uh, rigorous um, regulatory schemes, and all of those inputs um, and having to wrestle with those is what's really helped drive this research I did into information theory. And then that, in fact, that um, ended up helping us really improve and refine our processes. And we'll be talking about that a little bit at the end of this. So just right off the bat, um, one of the things that we think about when I think about content strategy is that really there's this notion of editorial content strategy and technical content strategy. You know, editorial being what it should the content be, who is it for, when, what's the life cycle of it. And then the technical content strategy is really around the modeling, the metadata, the systems. But, and, but for all of that, it's really about all of this in the, happens in the name of trying to move information from one place to another. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. And so if we can keep that in mind as we go forward, I think that will be helpful because all of these items that we see on the screen right here are really about driving that alignment so that we can move that information. So I guess the question I'd like to start with is, what does success look like for content strategy? Like if you've done it right, or we can do it for information architecture as well. If you're doing it right, what does that look like? And if folks wanted to put a couple items, any ideas into the chat, that would be great. I'd love to see what folks think like. At the end of the day, if our content strategy has been successful, it's not about having an editorial calendar. It's not about you know having the right audiences. It's about doing something. And what is that? If anyone has any thoughts, feel free to put those in the Zoom chat. All right. Well, maybe we'll come back to that. Uh, there we go. Making easier information easier to find. Absolutely. Thank you, Melissa. I was hanging out there. Retention. Yep, right information, uh, value, yep, impact, satisfied users. All of those things, I'm sure there'll be more coming up, but all of those are about, you know, getting the right information to the right person is all, you know, is really what we're talking about today. And I believe that's at the heart of information architecture, taxonomy, and with the content strategy. So, yeah, so I think some actually already said this, but really in my mind, we've been successful when we can, when we can move information easily from one place to another. And if we take it back to that foundational part and really break it down in that basic level, <clears throat> that really opens up a number of discussions as to what it is we're actually doing. And when we're doing this, in order to move information from one place to another, we're ostensibly crossing a boundary. Right now we're crossing the boundary from my office through the internet into your computers, into your screens, your microphones and stuff like that. But when we're doing content strategy IA, there's a lot of different boundaries we need to cross. And understanding those is an essential part of getting this and moving the information because different boundaries are gonna have different needs. And these are just some of the boundaries we might look into. I think one person mentioned the um, good content strategy is going to support retention. You know, that retention is about having the information um, available over the appropriate time frame. Boundaries might be about distance. Um, language is a boundary that we often wrestle with. Sometimes we have to move information across systems. 
And I'm sure we've all worked on projects where we had to create content that spoke to people with different levels of expertise or understanding of different topic areas. So one of the things we're always looking at is what are the boundaries we need to cross and how do we understand them? And how then do we build the things we need to build in order to allow that information to cross that boundary? And I'll give a couple examples. I think one of the most extreme ex examples of this is the uh, golden record that went out on the Voyager spaceships. You know, this was a lot of people put a lot of thought into putting information on those and then putting it in there in such a way that somebody in a hundred thousand years, a million years, five million years, whatever, might run into it and might be able to figure out how to how to use it. And so that was an example of a massive boundary. We don't, we just had to make assumptions about who that end user was going to be. Fortunately, in most of the work we do, we don't have to make too many assumptions about the users, or we shouldn't be. We have the opportunity usually to do the research to understand them better. So the person I'm going to be talking about a lot today is Claude Shannon. He, uh, I don't know if there's any electrical engineers out there um, or other folks who are familiar with his work, but in the um, late 40s, he came up with this idea of information theory which is really the backbone of almost all of our electronic communications today. Uh, he, I've been told he's there at Bell Labs. He was at Bell Labs when he did this. There are two statues at the front of it. One of them is Alexander Graham Bell and the other one is Claude Shannon. I've never been there. I'm not sure if that's the case, but that just goes to show how important his work was. And fundamentally, he was in the pro his goal the goal of information theory is to figure out how to reproduce information at one point that started someplace else. Oops. Now, full disclosure, the work he was doing was very technical. It was based on, it was not about the semantics of the information, but really just the physical transformation of the information. He was the person who um, coined the term bit for like the most basic unit of information. Um, and he really viewed it as an engineering problem. So a lot of the stuff we'll, I'll be talking about tonight is aligned with the work that he did conceptually, but uh, just to be clear, we're not gonna be creating any equations for how to move this information or doing any of the math that was involved in his stuff, but really we're just taking his basic ideas and seeing how they apply. And when I first saw this diagram, uh, when I was doing my work uh, many years ago, it just puts so many things into place for me. And this is really going to be the premise for most of the conversation tonight. What he was able to do is identify that in order to move information from the source to the destination, there has to be information. It needs to be transmitted. It needs to be received. And it needs to be, um, it needs to be received and then made available to its destination. And then he identified this notion of noise as being the part that's making that makes this communication difficult. And his work was trying to identify how do we codify the amount of noise in the channel so that we can create the information with the right amount of redundancy in it so that it will make it so, so that the whole message will find its way across. And I'd argue for the work that we do as IAs and content strategists, we are taking these messages we're, often we're creating the content, um, identifying what the message needs to be, then it needs to be transmitted. And then in the middle there, it's stored. You know, at some point it's gotta be stored somewhere so that that signal can then be sent to the receiver and then to the destination. And what we have in there and what he has as well, but is this notion of, you know, collecting the information, encoding it, transmitting it or storing it, receiving it, decoding it, and then making it generally available to other people. And in each of those stages, this noise or entropy can enter the system. And that's really what we're working with when we do this work, is how do we reduce that noise and make this as easy as possible to move. So the first big insight that I had for this, and I think this was really speaks to the value of user research, is that this notion of alignment the more that the information source and the destination are aligned, 
with their understanding of the information that needs to be transmitted, the less information that needs to be transmitted. I don't know if that, and I'll have some examples in a minute, but if you think about it right now, we're all speaking, I'm speaking English and the assumption is everyone here can understand English. That means we don't need to translate into different languages. So there's less effort that needs that's necessary to move it from here to there. Um, and so that's one form of alignment. Um, and if you think about the different boundaries we talked about, that's just the boundary of language. We also probably have a similar understanding of content strategy and information architecture. So we're gonna be able to speak to this at a certain, you know, with a certain vocabulary. All of those are forms of alignment. And it means that we can reduce the amount of information that needs to travel across this wire. One great example of this was in World War II. Actually, it started in World War I. Uh, when they were the uh, armies were the US armies and the uh, Allied armies were trying to communicate over radios. There was all this work done to in cryptology to how to you know, how to send secure messages, but they didn't have it, but it was sometimes very difficult to do that in the field. And at one point they realized that there were, one point someone heard two Choctaw soldiers speaking in Choctaw and realized that if those two folks were in different places, but talking over the radio, no one else would be able to understand them. And so this is an example where the alignment of these folks understanding the same language allowed them to communicate, but made it very difficult for anyone else to understand what was being said. Again, so that's the importance of that notion of alignment. Again, with those folks understanding that same language, they were able to communicate very easily. The other part of this diagram from Claude Chen is what I call the channel all the technology that needs to go in between moving this information from one place to another. Now, if we were in the same room, the channel would just be um, you know, over through the air as we're talking. But most of the work that we do is really about the technology and how do we transmit it from here to there. And so this is where we're looking at, you know, what, it, what are the interfaces that are necessary um, you know, what are, the inter what are the interfaces that are necessary to transmit and receive? What are the uh, technologies necessary? What are the integrations that are necessary? What's the metadata necessary to help move this? All of those things, I'd say, are part of this channel. And again, when we at the beginning, I showed the editorial and the technical content strategy, and I really see this being related to that technical component of the content strategy. So this is a great example of alignment and understanding your channel. As Paula mentioned at the beginning, I like to do a fair amount of sea kayaking. This picture here is taken, um, this is called Spencer Lighthouse. It's up at the northern end of the Inside Passage in Southeast Alaska. And if you look out to the uh, right there, you'll be looking into the Gulf of Alaska. And this was a really important lighthouse during World War II. Uh, the important part for this presentation was that at one point I was paddling in and amongst the islands that you can see in the background. And I was visiting a friend of mine who was a commercial fisherman and had his boat um, uh, tied up in there. And we were talking for a while. And at one point they looked at their watch and they said, oh, it's high tide. I need to go check my email. At which point I was a little confused, but it turned out that because this is an important communications hub, it had it had um, cell phone towers there. And at high tide, he had line of sight to the cell phone towers. But at low tide, he didn't because he was in one of those bays there. So to me, that was just like this classic example of really needing to understand the full context of the information that's there. An example that in order to trans you know transmit through the across this channel you need to understand the tides the weather where the cell phone towers were and all that which stuff we don't normally encounter but it's a great example of how this how we really need to think about this project holistically
I think this also really speaks to um, have a show of hands. Has everyone seen this diagram before? People raise their hand on the. Uh, let me just say that if you haven't seen the diagram before, um, I strongly recommend reading this piece by uh, Marsha Bates. It's extremely valuable. It, I keep going back to it. It keeps being extremely valuable in terms of helping me think about what it means to address information seeking behavior. But the important part of this is that this is all about alignment. Um, uh, I can't put the link in the chat right now, someone asked, but we can send it out elsewhere. Also, if you just type in berry picking and Marsha Bates, uh, you'll find your way here as well. Um, but the important thing of this work is that each step of the way, this is a, supposed to be an example of someone in um, information seeking behavior. And each step of the way, the person is gathering more context so they can ask a better question and get closer and closer to the question, the, the information that they really need. And all of this is about building that alignment. Um, each step of the way, you're building more alignment between the person who's looking for the information and the online search interface or the reference librarian or whoever is mediating that search. And so I just wanted to put this in there because this is such an important part of all of our work and um, just wanted to make sure that we all got a chance to think about it in this context. Second. Yeah. Okay. So um, I recommend this book right here, Sorting Things Out by Jeffrey Boker and Susan Lee Starr. They talk a lot about the boundaries, but the important part here is that this observation that for information to be perceived, it must reside in one, more than one context. And if that's really the premise of what we're working on here. So I'm gonna go into one or two more examples and we'll talk a little bit about what it means to actually put this into um, practice. So uh, I will assume that most people here are familiar with Paul Revere's ride. Apologies if you're not, um, there's a good article on it in web Wikipedia. But the idea of this, you know, at least for Longfellow's poem, the U.S. colonists, the American colonists were waiting for the British to attack, and they didn't know if they would come by land or by sea. So we had the one if by land, two if by sea line, which was they were going to have um, lights up in the Old North Church to help let folks know how the British were coming to attack. And if we think about this, this is a, such a great example of they only needed to send two bits of information to get this to get this message across. The first bit was the British are coming by putting lights up in the North Church. And the second bit was, is there one or two, two lanterns? And the reason they were able to do that with such little information, trans, the reason they need to tra transmit so such little information was that both the sender and the receiver understood what the domain of the information, exactly what it meant. There'd been training on each side. So they understood there was an alignment there in terms of what was gonna be communicated. They totally, they were in agreement on what the domain was. They knew its channel, its capacity. They were doing this at night and it needed to be a clear night. So they knew that the lanterns were gonna work. If it wasn't a clear night or it was in the middle of the day, they might not, they might've needed a different modality. But here they knew, they understood the channel. And then they had to cross a boundary. It had to cross, the message needed to cross at night and it needed to cross the Charles River. Um, so all of this sort of encapsulates what we've been talking about. And I think we'll be coming back to it because what it shows is as we're doing content strategy and information architecture, the more we know about the center and receiver, the more user research we do, the more targeted the information can be. Um, the better we understand the domain, the better we can target, the better we can create that information. The better we understand the channel, the better we can construct the methodology for moving the information, the for physically moving it. Uh, same thing with the boundary. Slide. So 
that's a lot of theory, a lot of talk. Uh, I'm going to go into this next part here with some examples. Uh, I guess I'd ask, are there any questions about what we've covered so far? I could take one or two and then move on. Gary, there was a, a question in the chat from James McDanger um, asking, uh, is language then a form of compression, filtering, or obfuscation? <laughs> that's a, that's well, a I, think, <laughs> I think that's an awesome question. And I think it, it, it can be all three. Uh, certainly in the example we saw, um, it was you know, it was a form of obfuscation for folks who weren't aligned, who didn't know that language. And uh, it can also be, uh, you know, as we think about the work we do when we're talking to folks, we often see, you know, it can be a form of obfuscation, like when we go to a doctor and they're speaking in their doctorese and we don't quite understand it. You know, people can do it that way. Um, language can be a form of compression as well, because it's a way of taking this idea that's in my head and trying to get it into something that can be transmitted. So um, I think it can be all of those things. And again, that's where we need to understand the channel and the context and the boundary that's being crossed. Cool. All right. So the lens I use when I'm doing my work is to think about things this way. How do we, what do we know about the sender and the receiver? And I do this by user understanding, doing as much user research as we can do, um, usability studies, you know, user goals, those types of things. And users are the folks on both sides of the wire. So if you're working for an organization, you really need to understand what that organization wants to communicate. And once you understand who they want to communicate it to, you need to understand what it is they're interested in, what their model is for receiving this information, you know, what languages they understand, what level of expertise they have, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other part for understanding the center receiver is also understanding the information itself. And then the channel, understanding the infrastructure and the capacity of it. Um, so again, these are all, and then the boundaries is really where we think about the full context. So as we think about our practice doing this work, just breaking it down like this can offer often answer a number of questions that we have about that we've run into. Like, oh, what you know, what do we need to communicate? What format should it be in? How long should the articles be? How long should they should be they should they uh, be available? All of that stuff will come to light if we start asking these questions about the sender receiver, the channel, and the boundaries themselves. And so just as a, you know, example of how we do this at Factor is that, you know, we do have, and this shouldn't surprise anybody. This is, there's no magic in our methodology, but it is why we have so many different assessments that we'll do um, to really understand the users, the channel and the domain or the boundary. Um, and obviously always starting with the business goals. What are we trying to accomplish? What does this information need to do. And then the modeling is really where we start to build out the channel, understanding how this, how we're going to describe this information so we can move it from here to there, the content model schemas, the experience. Um, and then one thing that's really important is to understand that training, help, documentation can be a really potent um, tool in our toolkit as we move forward with these types of projects. Because the whole purpose of training, um, tool tips, documentation, is to align, provide more context for the sender and the receiver, usually for the receiver. So they can, they can start to align with that content better so that they can get, as they learn more and more about it, it makes it easier to move that information across the wire. Just having a list of acronyms, right? Think about the, how many times you've gone into a large organization and you said, oh my gosh, I wish they just had a list of acronyms. That right there is a form of documentation that can help it make it easier to move information from point A to point B. So 
So when we think about this work, we really break it up and think about the information layer um, in the middle of how this information is going to get expressed and how it's going to be stored and managed. And this is just sort of a diagram of how these different assessments fit into the work, one way of doing this work of taking this and making it tangible. So what does this really look like? You know, uh, for years I was, I used to ask myself, why is it that Craigslist works so well? And they haven't updated their, I mean, they're breaking all the rules of good UI these days, but it keeps working. Every time I go there, I can find what I'm looking for. Rarely need to look at more than one or two categories to find things. But once I had this lens, this information theory lens, and I realized that in Craigslist, the sender and the receiver are generally the same person. I mean, not like I'm not buying things for myself, but I'm buying things from people who are selling things that I want and who are pretty much, you know, probably we have the same understanding of what's being sold. It's not a company that's trying to push something on me. It's just like, Hey, I got a lawnmower and hey, I want a lawnmower. So we're able to go in there. And that's, I believe, the reason that Craigslist has been able to maintain this UI with very little changes for the past 20, 25 years. I don't know how long they've been doing it, but it's uh, pretty straightforward. And again, this is because the buyers and the sellers are very highly aligned. Now we can think of a library which has a much wider range of offerings. Um, but libraries work because the librarians, the folks who work there, share a common education and a pretty, pretty rigorous one at that, that allows them to go into a library, hit, pick up a book and know where it sh should go. And same thing, you know, and that's why we libraries have reference librarians. That's why people need to learn how to use libraries. It's not something you can just, figure out on your own, but you do need some education on how the libraries work. But as a result of putting that energy into the system, that energy being that shared education, it allows them to so store a massive amount of information and make it available. Um, you know, not only store it, but put it in there and then also get it out efficiently. And then we've got Google. They they put all of their chips in the technology and a very simple user interface, right? If we think about it, you know, Craigslist needs very little technology, not a lot of user research. You know, they're just very highly aligned. Google's, their whole goal was to decrease the noise in the channel, and they were going to do that all with technology. The results being, you know, that they need this massive infrastructure to make that happen. You know, um, and which is, I mean, what they're doing is amazing, but it is a result of the, you know, them putting a massive amount of energy into the technology part of the problem. They're not trying to solve the problem around information, although they provide guidelines and do some stuff around that. They're just going to use this technology and do that and, you know, um, as they go forward. So these are examples of you know, you, we can solve problems by, if the problems are open to it, making sure that the sender and the receiver are highly aligned. And that really reduces the amount of noise or energy that needs to be put in the system to get that information across. We can put that information, that energy into the system by making sure that the sender and the receiver um, share um, a, um, a, that educational background of being librarians. Or here with Google, we put the energy into the system <clears throat> by massive amounts of technology. And as we're doing our work, we can always we can think of this as like a portfolio of things. Like, how do what's the best way to move this information from one point to the other? Maybe it's a knowledge base. Maybe it's more training for the users. Maybe it's a better interface. All of those things can impact the project, um, and all of them. You know that right port. Once you find that right mix you'll identify the best way to move the information for the least amount of effort. Um, all of this depends on, at least when we do this at enterprise level, having good solid foundations. 
Um, so on top of all of this or underneath all of this work we're doing, you know, as IAs and content strategists, you know, these fundamentals still need to be in place. We need governance and maintenance. The organization needs to be aligned. They need to have the right resources, the right technology. Compensation needs to be in place to support this. All of those things need to be there. And I just add these, this slide in a couple hours just to make sure that we understand that this is the information theory part is sitting on top of just the fundamental foundations that we're all constantly clamoring our customers or our companies to institute. So I've talked this a little bit, but you know, really what are the tools we have in our tool books? Um, the first one is really just to start asking the right questions. Are we aligned with our strategy? You know, is our data aligned with our strategy? It's a pretty simple question, but if we know what our strategy is, we should be able to understand if we have the data to support it. And if we don't have a strategy, then we're never gonna be able to create a content strategy. Do we even have the data we need? Can customers and employees, do they have access to it? Is it aligned with their needs? Is it aligned with their ability to find the information? And again, these slides will be shared, but you know, these are all questions, these are all tools that we can use at the beginning of a project to see if that alignment is there so that people can use this information. Um, I think I've said this before, but really the user research and the analytics, you, building that user understanding, I think is an essential tool in our toolbox um, as we go forward with this. Training and documentation, I don't think gets nearly the um, uh, the primacy, primacy, primacy uh, gets the attention it deserves. Um, and absolutely, yes, we could replace data with content and it's all about the same. Um, so anyways, the um, I really think the training and documentation is a place where uh, we can spend more time and then the information modeling. How do we model this so that it can travel through the channel so that it's organized in such a way that people could find it today or from records management, people could find it in a hundred years. How do we make sure that it's modeled in such a way that it's gonna support the different use cases of get moving it from point A to point B? And then when we go into design the channel, you know, the experience, how do we make sure that the experience has the information that we need, that it needs to do? How do we understand that it's doing, you know, the, the experience is one of the places where we can put effort and energy into the system. You know, we need to make sure that it, the, we're meeting the users where they're at. Again, the models are an important part of the channel, creating, making sure that we've got the models there to support the appropriate content tagging, the, the faceted navigation, all of those things are driven by the models, the information models, and then the content model. Like how are we actually creating the content? What are the chunks we're creating? What are the different content types? So that we know that we can move those through the channel as well. And we've talked about the foundations uh, there. So I have this for taxonomists. It's the same thing I believe for content strategists and information architects. Um, you know, building that shared understanding, building the foundation, creating the right experience, and then also determining what and how much information we need. Again, all of that's going to come out of this lens of using information theory, because we saw with the Paul Revere example, you will identify that very little information needed to be transmitted because the sender and the receiver were so well aligned. So I'll leave you this quote here from James Gleek. If anyone, if you haven't read his book, The Information, um, it's a fantastic romp through um, people, use, the way different ways information has been used over time. Talks about Claude Shannon and information theory as well, but um, a great book. So thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. Ah, oh, that stuff is so fundamental. I like to think so, but. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, questions? Anyone uh, questions for Gary? A lot of good stuff here. I have a question, if you don't mind. Um, the so this this model of of the sender and the receiver and information flowing from one person to another. How, how do you see that playing out in interfaces today? Um, I guess I'm curious if you have in your mind good and bad examples. Uh, like who's who's getting it? and who's not getting it? Well, I mean, again, I think it comes to understanding where that alignment comes from. I mean, like, you know, if the IRS, well, if, let's say, you know, if Google had an interface like Craigslist, it wouldn't work, right? But Craigslist works because they understand their users and what they're what it is they're trying to do. So it works, it's a great interface. You know, it works efficiently for a, you know for the people who need to use the site, um, and so I you know I don't know you know I, I I can tell you my health insurance company has not figured it out, um, but uh, yeah I don't know it's, it's you know I think it's when you go to a site and you know the inf you get the information you need easily. It's at the right tone. It's the right level of understand expertise, right level of detail. That's an organization that's looked at, you know, how do they align with their users and how do they actually make it available? Yeah, sounds like that's kind of the key piece, right? Which is that alignment piece. Yeah, that's that's really what we've that's really what came out of this for me was how important that alignment was. Um, and again how important that alignment was and understanding the boundaries or the, the context. Um, Cause those, you know, the more you understand what wants to be, what someone needs to send and what person, you know, what person is ready for and understand how well they understand each other. That's yeah. going to tell you what you can do or, you know, help you understand what you can transmit, how it needs to be done. Does it need to be translated? Does it need to be provided in different formats? Do we need to have, um, you know, all of those things? I have a question here from Stuart Maxwell. Do you think the chat GPT type interface is an example of a stronger alignment between sender and receiver than say a, re a search engine interface? I'm so tired of AI conversation. <laughs> you knew you know what's going to come in every conversation. Sorry, now. Stuart. Um, <laughs> no, I think the I mean when I when we've done work on AI projects, uh I've always been worried that you know for some reason there's some it, they were somehow different from what we're normally doing. But in my mind, the um the you know, when you have the large language models like chat GPT, that's just another information source that needs to fit in this scenario. So, you know, and I guess the you know, I guess Stuart's question was, you know, is, do I think they're better than a search interface? And again, I it really comes down to what information are we trying to convey and uh, what's, you know, and why? What do the users want? Like if I want to know, understand, what the um uh, well just yesterday I was looking up like what's the IRS um uh what how much does the IRS suggest you uh, expense per mileage on a car like I'm not gonna go to I don't want to go to chat GPT and assume they may have figured this out because I don't have the transparency and where they're gonna get that information. If we go to the IRS site and type in um you know car reimbursement or miles reimbursement, I know I've got the right thing. If I want to write uh, a mediocre email or you know mediocre something, and I just need to get it done fast, then 
yeah, I think the Jet GPT is going to be there, but I don't know if that's all that satisfying. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I I don't know. I don't know. That's a very good answer. Uh, let's see. There's some other ones. There. There's a question about um, <laughs> communication between taxonomists and developers. That's yeah. kind of interesting. Um, how do we bridge that boundary? Yeah, and then that's in like my whole career uh, trying to figure that one out. But the, uh, I mean, if we look at it, that the part of it is coming, figuring out what is that, uh, what is that shared language? You know, what where where is the commonality of what they're trying to do? And I've found that when I'm working with developers who are really trying to solve a problem of moving information from point A to point B, they can be really productive and they'll have really good ideas. But when I'm working with developers who are trying to just put things in a database, it's a lot more difficult and we need to spend more time talking about this diagram here, you know, and if we, you know, in some ways, if we can break the problem down um, and really, well, I'm, when I'm talking to developers, I'm, and I need to, you know, I'm always, my biggest things I'm going to talk about user user needs and governance, because that seems to be the best way to break through the, the developer barrier of, oh, I can put that in a, in a, in a, in a database table. Yeah, they can, it's, 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 it's really interesting to think about how different people conceive of the same thing in different ways. And yeah. there's yeah. like a, Go there's ahead. like a, there's like a, an, an understanding piece that I think can only come from being human, which begs into this AI conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Can AI have that understanding? Yeah. And, you know, to put it in the context of the, the developer question, um, you know, it, it is that shared under, you know, where is that shared understanding? <laughs> you know, and you know, it, you know, has, you know, is that like, so a great example was a number of many, many years ago, I was working at a, um, for a bank that doesn't exist anymore. They were standing up a new search engine for their website. They hired me to help them come up with the synonyms and figure out how to implement it. And so I went in, I was like, oh yeah, this is great. We'll just, and we can update synonyms for the search terms on the website. And this is like in, uh, a long time ago before my hair was gray. And the development team had been great. I had a great time working with them. And we got to the end. I was like, yeah, and we'll update the synonyms probably every couple of weeks once we look at the search logs. And they said, absolutely not. You can put, you can give us a list of synonyms in a search, in a spreadsheet, and we'll consider them every six months in our dev, as part of our dev cycle. We went back and forth and back and forth. And finally, I said, well, what is your folks' uh, bonus structure? What's your bonus? What's your compensation based on? And at that point, it was 100, all of their bonuses was based on uptime of the system. So they had absolutely no reason to want to allow any changes to the system being made by somebody else. And so that's just an example where the compensation structure, the business structure wasn't aligned with the needs of transferring, getting this information from here to there. Um, yeah. So, yeah. A couple of, a couple of, things about that that come to mind. One is that I wonder, you know, if there is, if you see any difference in working with developers, you know, as uh, when you're talking about taxonomy versus content, given that I would expect, you know, developers would certainly have a similar sort of, you know, obviously data, you know, perspective or, or whatever vocabulary that, that, you know, where uh, taxonomy would, would maybe Kind of resonate with them more than than potentially the you know the content. Yeah. Um, so that that's sort of one question. And then now I've forgotten the second part of that question. But just wondering if, if you've if you've seen that or in your experience. Yeah, I mean, 
the problem we run into with tech, taxonomies is that develop it's often like, oh, I'll just build a couple of tables and we don't need tools or infrastructure around it. <laughs> the problem with content is that it's this big amorphous thing and right. you know, people don't, you know, the whole notion of voice, all the things that need to go into con to having good content is just foreign. It, it can't be decomposed into a database easily. And I think it's just hard, but um, you know, I do think that, you know, being able to represent the goal, the business goals, um, is really important being able to represent the, um, goals of the users. And then the governance stuff is really what keeps coming back to me, back for me. But, you know, the content strategy stuff, I've got client, one client been working with for five or six years. And it's like, we can keep doing taxonomy stuff, but until you get your content strategy figured out, we're just going to be banging our head against the wall. And, Finally, we're getting to do that, but it's been a long journey. Yeah. Yeah. Following James? up on that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, Mary. go ahead, Paula. Oh, no, I think we're going to do the same thing, which is uh, James asks, uh, aren't taxonomies instances of ontologies? And if your ontology is aligned with business uh, slash IT domain model, the ubiquitous language is established. I think that was a little bit what I was trying to get at too, which is, you know, is there at least a, a more of a shared language between, uh, or that, that's a much more complicated question than what I was asking. What I was getting at was sort of the greater likelihood of a shared sort of vocabulary and language between taxonomists and, and developers. Um, <clears throat> But this question is specifically about taxonomies and ontologies and that language. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of conversation around. I, you know, in my mind, taxonomies are, you know, a part of ontologies. Ontologies are really sort of stitching them together. Uh, to James' point, though, absolutely, you can start to model, do a better job of modeling an organization with an ontology, but still, you still have to be able to model the organizational goals and the organizational perspective. And that model needs to be expressed in the interfaces. It needs to be supported through the integrate, all the integrations of the different systems. It needs to be able to be um, modeled in the um, analytics framework that you have. And you know that analytics need to be able to work through the full life cycle of the content. So there's a lot there that needs to happen and all of it's around that alignment between of internal alignment around what your message is and what your goals are and who your audiences are, and then making sure you can bridge that, take that alignment to the needs of your users. Melissa, I love your comment about needing to go to HR to get your project working. That's great. And the great share from Karen there on the, the paper about the folly of rewarding A while hoping for B. I'll yeah. bookmark that. <laughs> a lot of discussion here about tech docs. And one of the things that, you know, I just wanted to sort of call out that you that you uh, talked about the importance, obviously, of training and documentation and stuff, Gary. And I think, you know, I, the, the technical writers and, and documentation folks on the call, I'm sure, are happy to hear that too, that, you know, the, that content is often kind of the, the lower priority or, you know, less likely to get the kind of, uh, you know, investment and attention as, you know, other kinds of content, you know, uh, you know, it's not that it's, you know, that marketing content, for example, isn't also, you know, isn't significantly important too, but, uh, but I think a lot of people in the tech, you know, in the tech docs part of the, the uh, business tend to feel like they, don't necessarily get the get the love that that they should. Yeah, and I think that's where I think this framework can be really helpful because if we can show that the not only that we've got the tech con content, but that we can get it to people at the right time and in the right level, then we can reduce the amount of energy that needs to be put into this whole system. You know. Um, that you know it, it needs to be readable it needs to be easily found all of that stuff because once again once that source and destination are lined up <clears throat> you know you're taking you're taking the weight off a lot of the other parts yeah and talking about things like <clears throat> your, your experience looking up something at the on the irs site or you know your your health insurance company or something right I and mean, the alignment between 
between the sender and receiver there has to be so, you know, so well done when you are, you know, using a product and, you know, need information quickly, or whatever, and don't, you know, don't have time to, to read, yeah. you know, 25 pages of documentation or something. And, right. you know, understanding where the users are in their, you know, their journey of using the product and what they need at that point and everything is so critical. Yeah. And I think it's, important to recognize we, I've mostly been talking about the alignment between you know like an organization and the customers but there's a lot of internal alignment that needs to happen as well you know there needs to be alignment between the company strategy and the information assets you have and the organizational alignment in terms of well we talked about it in terms of this compensation aligned with where we're going all of those things can help are necessary to um you know make this seemingly simple di diagram with five boxes and a few lines work. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot of things that go in there, go into that. Absolutely. Any other uh, comments, questions from, uh, from our audience here? I was just going to say, I love this stuff so much. Um, it brings me back to my grad school days, but, and, and, but also like, I feel like it's fundamental to how I bring my thinking to my, my work and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I really appreciate you bringing this to us. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I will say if folks take nothing away, nothing else away from it, just recognizing that energy, you know, effort goes into each of these boxes and each of these lines. And if you can identify all that effort and figure out, you know, and break it down that way, you know, that's been extremely helpful for me when I'm working with my clients. Yeah. Yeah. Really important. All right. Well, uh, if there are other questions, uh, oh, uh, we've got a question here about a good contact for you, Gary. Um, yeah, so, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, my email address is here on the slides. I'm assuming we'll be sharing the slides. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, both of those are great ways to get a hold of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. All right. Well, uh, plenty of industry is built into... <laughs> Confusopolis <laughs> by design, insurance tech, medical building, billing, sorry, thus requiring hiring a specialist translator. Do they really care to solve? Is that customer service or content strategy, James? Mm -hmm. Probably both, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, if folks do take anything away from this or find this helps them, please feel free to reach out. I'd love to know what parts of this resonate the most. Um, and I'm always happy to, you know, jump on a call or something if folks want to reach out. Great. Thanks so much, Gary. Uh, thanks everyone for hanging in. Sorry, we had a little bit of kerfuffle at the beginning as we had some strange uh zoom that behavior was... going on but appreciate your patience um and we hope you will join us again at uh another of our events reminder there were links in the chat there for uh all of our <clears throat> website and linkedin and uh slack and youtube so hope to see you uh on one of those and see us uh see you at a, another event thanks for joining us thank you everyone good night Right.